Hello and welcome to my CE lecture. My name is Peter Tawil and uh, this lecture is called Access uh, the Quest for the Extra Canal and the goal of this uh, lecture is mostly to help uh, with the first step of the root canal procedure which is access and which is the most important step in finding and locating all the canals and we're gonna focus later a bit on locating uh, the MB2s for example and upper molars the middle mesials and lower molars and to understand whenever we're doing a root canal what we're looking at to read the floor uh, uh, the map on the floor that a tooth each tooth has to offer and to basically be understanding what we're doing and avoid being like our cute little monkey here looking inside the mouth without uh, knowing what he's looking at so uh, the course learning objectives is first to list the tools needed to facilitate endodontic access. The first part, I'm going to focus on uh, different tools uh, that I use. I have no financial affiliation to any company, just as a disclosure here. Uh, it's just things that I picked up over the years and uh, that I think makes root canals a lot easier. And uh, I thought to share with you before we uh, start, and that's the first part which is uh, this first audio part and uh, then we'll go in and uh, look a bit on the anatomy uh, to describe the number of canals that a tooth can contain uh, describe the landmarks and the anatomy inside a tooth uh, understand the relationships of the pulp chamber to the clinical crown and understand the relationship on the pulp uh, pulp chamber floor itself and of course to when to know when to keep looking and when to stop uh, to avoid perforations and whatnot uh, know how to look for MB2s in upper maxillary molars and know how to look uh, for middle mesial canals in lower mandibular molars. Now this is a paper that we're going to be looking a bit later on in this lecture. It's from Krasner and Ranko in 2004 and I just like this quote starting off. Uh, they say in their intro, uh, attempting to treat the root canal system without a detailed anatomic description would be the equivalent of a physician looking for an appendix without ever having read Gray's Anatomy. Uh, and uh, the subject that we'll be covering is the first part is the tools, uh, then the endodontic anatomy, uh, then we'll look at the anatomy of the pulp chamber floor and specifically at that paper from Krasner and Ranko, and then we'll go with some clinical cases and clinical pictures uh, to give you kind of a hands-on idea of what we're looking on. So. Uh, you'll see in application what we'll be talking about in this lecture. So first part is the tools. Uh, now the tools obviously, uh, I'm sure you already use it, but the rubber dam isolation is a must in root canal therapy. And uh, the reason why we started most of dental boards implemented as a requirement uh, is uh, to prevent aspiration mostly of sharp endodontic files or swallowing sharp endodontic files which is here on the radiograph on the right it's a file that's stuck in the intestinal loop and as you can imagine files are very sharp and sometimes they don't get through if you swallow them so they might cause severe complications and if you uh, remember or you might not uh, have heard about it but back in the days uh, endodontic files used to have a little uh, hole in the top of the file and you might even see nowadays some files that some companies sell it has a little hole on top and this hole was meant to put a little hook in it uh, it's almost like a chain hook and in case the patient swallows it or uh, inhales it uh, you can actually fish it back out now some files still has that little hole uh, just because there's some countries that it's not mandatory to use a rubber dam and they still use that little hook technique but uh, that's a very dangerous way to do it and you never want to be fishing out a file uh, so in north america it's uh, not a technique that is used that little hook on the file and what we uh, uh, mandate is the rubber dam and the rubber dam is also a must on top of, you know, for the patient swallowing it or aspirating it, but it's to avoid bacteria. We know that saliva is full of bacteria, and if you're doing a root canal uh, disinfecting the chamber and the canals and you have saliva leaking, it almost it's, uh, defeats the purpose due to the fact that you're just bringing in tons of bacteria from the saliva back in your root canal system. 
So the, the rubber dam isolation will avoid the contamination from the saliva and it will block the patients from teach, uh, uh, having all the irrigants that we use, like the bleach, the chlorhexidine, that tastes very bad to get in their oral cavity. Now, latex allergies, and uh, obviously the rubber dams, most of them are in latex, like our gloves. Uh, now, latex allergies, the prevalence and the severity of late latex have been increasing, uh, and they're becoming uh, more severe. Uh, now, uh, rubber dams come into, like the gloves, uh, nitrile, and the newer rubber dams are getting more flexible. Uh, the newer rubber dams made out of non-latex materials are getting more flexible, more durable, and even some of them can resist chloroform whenever you're doing retreats. So something to keep in mind and to keep in your office whenever you have somebody comes with latex allergies or sensitivity. Uh, now, before we start, in order to get a good rubber dam isolation, uh, you wanna be able to put the clamp and uh, for broken down teeth, the best way to get isolation for the clamp to be placed is to remove all the decay and this has to be done no matter what we need always to remove all the decay before we start a root canal uh, make it nice and clean but then we have the option of building it up with composite uh, us endodontists sometimes use like you see the pictures on the left here uh, we use the blue build-up material resin a composite and this is uh, we use it so the dentist can see the margin and avoid removing any additional tooth structure and you can use it as well and uh, if you're the one building up or restoring the tooth, you can do it like we're doing here on the right, the uh, central incisor, and uh, building it up basically with tooth colored uh, composite. Uh, other alternatives can be uh, doing an gingivectomy, either with a diamond burr, with an electro cutter, with laser, whatever you like, uh, just to expose part of the healthy tooth structure where the clamp can hang on. Uh, a crown lengthening can be done, uh, or we can even place the clamp over the gum tissue. Now that's as a last resort, but it's an option. We can always place the clamp over the tissue. We just have to tell uh, the patient that there'll be ulceration around where the clamp is and it'll be sore for a couple of days. But the gums will heal, if they, even if the clamp is a bit over them. Uh, now, whenever we're dealing with cases, uh, wherever you have braces, orthodontics, or like a bridge, like the one on the right, it's very hard to floss. You cannot floss the rubber dam in the embrasures, so you don't get a perfect seal. You always have a little gap. So in order to seal those gaps, you can use any kind of putty. And what I've been using is Aura Seal. Uh, it comes in, in a clocking form and a putty form. Uh, the advantage of Aura Seal is just... Uh, has the ability to stick to wet surfaces and it does not harden. So it's very easy to clean at the end after you're done. Now, uh, another a very important uh, aspect here is light and magnification. Now, uh, light uh, is a must to see what's going on inside the chamber. Uh, most endodontists out there, and even some dentists are starting to use uh, microscopes, but uh, most endodontists that I know uh, use uh, microscopes. Uh, microscopes give you the magnification up to some of them will offer up to 50 times magnification and it offers the lighting some of them even have xenon lighting and their lights have coaxial lighting so there's no shadow or anything like that that produces uh, now if you cannot afford to have a microscope which is understandable uh, what uh, I recommend is at least getting a good set of a pair of loops loops go from 2.5 to 8 I know most of uh, dentists that I know have loops that are 2.5. If you're buying some for specifically for endodontics, I would say get some 3.5 or higher if you're buying them just for endo. And obviously you wanna get also a headlight. Uh, now the headlights, there are several out there, different shape, different intensities, different weights. I would just say if you are buying a headlight for a set of loops, make sure that it's very light because putting the light on your loops will make them a lot heavier, the feeling that you have. And you can even have those headlights put on, uh, uh, like almost like a cap, like on a headband, to avoid having more weight on your glasses. Uh, now, some attachments, like this little attachment on the left picture, uh, if you buy the company's Q-Optic, and what I like about it is on top of the, so the you'll have the source light for your headlight, 
but on top of that you have the option of getting other attachments which like the attachments here that you see on the bottom right of that picture it's a probe it's a light probe so you can put this the source the battery pack and the light source into all these different attachments you can have a mirror a mini solar retractor but what i love is this little uh, they call the microscope diagnostic probe and it's a very tiny light that can go inside your access on the side to look for canals if you have pulp stone to investigate for fractures transilluminate for fractures uh, it gets very very useful if you're doing a lot of endodontics and this light, uh, the company, they call them the Radiant uh, LED Instruments. And that's the one on top I've been mentioning, the Microscope Diagnostic Probe. And uh, you, have, you can have your shine lining through a Minnesota retractor, a retractor, let's say you're doing wisdom teeth extraction or something like that. Or you can have it through your mirror for all your uh, operative and endo needs. Now, when it comes to mirrors, and uh, we even have micro mirrors nowadays, uh, you have to realize that mirrors, the one you typically use in a dental setting, the one that we use in dental schools, is the size 6 usually. Uh, now, they go from size 3 to 6, and the attachment can easily be changed in your handle. Uh, what I recommend for endo is the size 3, uh, just because it makes it a lot easier if you're doing uh, molars in the pack to uh, get the mirror back there without obstructing your view whenever you're putting your handpiece, your files. It's a, it's a very nice thing to have a smaller mirror. Now, as micro mirrors, uh, you can have a couple in your drawers. Uh, it's mostly for surgery, but sometimes if a patient have a very small openings and we're doing second molars, we'll use uh, micro mirrors to look around. And there's uh, many of them out there, but you have to make sure whenever you're buying a micro mirror, to actually have the mirror itself on there. Some of them will come just as a reflective metal, which is not uh, very clear. And the micro mirrors that have a piece of mirror on it, usually they're called HD uh, micro mirrors. So just keep that in mind. Now we'll move to burrs. Uh, burrs will, uh, I'll put them in primary burrs, which will basically be making our access, going through the crown till we find our chamber. And then we have secondary burrs, and secondary burrs are mostly, once we have our access, it's to uh, look around the floor for canals and open classifications and stuff like that. Uh, for primary burrs, uh, there's first step is the occlusion reduction burrs, just to reduce your occlusion. Uh, we know from some studies, like the Rosenberg study, that whenever a patient coming for you for an endo that has percussion sensitivity, biting sensitivity, uh, reducing the occlusion helps them significantly in their post-op pain uh, management. So it helps a lot with uh, post-op pain control if we reduce the occlusion. Now, usually I use the one on the left, a football shaped burr, just to slightly reduce the occlusion. Uh, but if you know you're going to have a crown on the tooth, you can be a bit more aggressive and take like a disc, a diamond disc on the right uh, and just reduce the cusp uh, rapidly this way. But that is if you know that, that the tooth you're treating will have, be having a crown. Uh, the second part will be uh, getting round burrs. And round burrs, uh, what I recommend is getting surgical length round burrs. And the point for a surgical length is to avoid having the handpiece in the way and blocking your vision whenever you're going. Especially when you're going down in a calcified tooth close to the chamber so deep that if you don't have a church, if you have a regular length, the handpiece will be completely down in the access and you won't be seeing anything. And that's where the surgical length burr will give you a nicer view of what's gonna, going on without blocking your view. And they come in different sizes, as you know, and I just put them there to show, just to remind you that uh, what I recommend, always choose, look at your pre-op x-ray and look at the chamber depth. And whatever the chamber depth is, you always want to choose a round bird that's smaller than the chamber depth. And this is you, so whenever you're going down, you'll actually feel the drop of your bird whenever you get to the chamber. If you have a bird that's too big, you'll never feel the drop, and you have to be very careful that you don't keep going and perforate. Uh, other useful burr to have is what we call the pulp chamber burr, or some companies call it the endo Z burr. Z is the initial of the person who invented it. 
the pulp chamber burr, what it is, it's a conical carbide burr that has a non-cutting uh, ball tip. Uh, the goal of that is to be able to put it all around the floor without risking any perforations and to basically polish all the outline of your access and push the mesial walls in to have a nicer access to your files into the canals. Now, crown access burrs, uh, whenever we're dealing with a crown, uh, porcelain, to go through porcelain, many studies have been done to see what's the safest way to go through porcelain without risking any cracks and fractures. Uh, what they found the best way is air abrasion, but as you can imagine, air abrasion takes forever and it's not clinically practical. So from the studies, the second best option was uh, to use diamond burrs. So to go to the porcelain, whenever you're going to a porcelain crown, uh, always use the roughest diamond uh, burr you have to remove the porcelain. And once you get to the metal substructure, you want a very efficient cutting burr. Uh, what I use usually is the transmetal burr, which I'm sure you have already. Uh, or if you don't, just make sure you use a very sharp a new burr, carbide burr, to go to the metal. And uh, the sharper it is, the better just to avoid any vibrations. Because the more vibration you have drilling to the crown, the more chances you create of cracking the porcelain. And once you found your floor, now if you want to polish the outline to a crown, uh, you can use the endo zebra, but a more efficient way and safer way would be to take a diamond burr. And they sell some diamond burrs with non-cutting tips also for the same purpose. Uh, but you can use any prosto bird that you have uh, in your laying in your office whenever you're dealing with a crown to polish the outlines. Now we'll come to secondary birds. Uh, for secondary birds, there are many out there and there have been many from long time ago and there's some that are newer. Now, the most basic and the cheapest way to have is uh, regular shank uh, low-speed round burrs. So you put it on the top left. Any small round burr you have, uh, you can put it and hopefully you get a straight line view to open the isthmus or look around the floor. Now, the problem with that is the handpiece will be in the way and it's going to block your view. And that's where all these other burrs came into play. First one on the top right is what we call the LN burr. Uh, the LN burr uh, was basically a long shank with the neck of the shank then it becomes very skinny, skinny, skinny with the diamond, with the round carbide burr at the tip of it. The problem with them, they're so fragile, the skinny tip, that it gets bent very easily and as soon as it gets a little bit bent, it becomes useless. So they don't last a long time. Uh, Dunn came on the ones on the top right, uh, sorry, bottom right, uh, what we call the Mueller burrs. Uh, now, the Mueller burrs, several companies will be selling those. Uh, they come in different sizes. Usually, you can buy a pack with five sizes, from smaller to bigger. They go from the yellow band to the blue band. And uh, what I like about them, especially if you're uh, uh, starting out an endo or you don't, you want to be more conservative, there's a, they're very conservative burrs. They last a long time. And uh, they give you, it's a very good length to give you a nice view whenever you're opening isthmuses or looking for a canal on the floor. Now, as you gain experience, and many endodontists has moved to what we call the Munz Discovery Burrs, which is on the top, uh, sorry, bottom left now. Uh, they came out about three, four years ago. And the advantage of them, they're a lot more cutting efficient. And uh, so things are done a lot faster. They're more expensive than the annular burrs. But if you want something that's very cutting efficient, you can go with the Munz Discovery burrs, as you see on the bottom left. And uh, that's, uh, and you might see this in some dental uh, magazines. Uh, they come in different lengths, uh, some are in 27, 31, and 34 uh, length, and in different sizes. Uh, we use them also to expose broken files like this uh, here we see on this picture to expose the broken file and then go with ultrasonic to remove it. Uh, so they have very different uh, utilities to uh, uses for it. Other burrs out there is, that's a more recent burr, is the endoguide. Uh, they're called the precision microendodontic burrs. Uh, again, they come in different sizes. Uh, the key element of these burrs is instead of being a round burr, it's 
a narrow shaped burr so it stays uh, more centered within the canal if you know where the canal is uh, so that's for those uh, now for gates some of you might still be using gates glittens uh, it's not a bad thing uh, just have to be careful not going too deep with those uh, they come in different sizes uh, they are used to uh, open the orifice just coronally and remove the triangle of dentin that's kind of obstructing the orifice now uh, dense ply cells uh, also a gates called the x-gate and the X gate is basically a gate split on one to four incorporated in one design. So it'll, the idea is just to save you uh, instruments laying in your tray or in your sponge. Uh, now we'll talk about ultrasonic tips. And ultrasonic tips are, became really increasingly helpful in endodontics. And uh, I'm going to spend a bit of time just talking about it here. Uh, Buchanan, that I'm sure you know, uh, mentioned in one of his papers that any clinician who performs molar endodontics without ultrasonics is working too hard, uh, is experiencing more anxiety than necessary, and is most likely not finding MB2s in more than 40% of the maxillary molar cases, which we'll see later on in the anatomy section of this lecture. Um, upper molars, especially specifically upper first molar, should be having close to 90%. Uh, but you have to know where you're looking and you have to have the instruments that can get you there. Now, when we're talking endodontic, ultrasonic uh, handpieces, it's different from what the older ones that you used to use for cleaning. Uh, now, uh, the endodontic ones are piezo, and piezo is basically an electrical current that produces a wave in the crystals. And inside that handpiece that you use, there'll be a series of ceramic discs or quartz plates, depending on which model you buy. And then the electric current passes through it, and then the energy from there, the vibration, it transferred to the tip. Now, uh, the piezo, the advantage, it creates a linear motion uh, compared to the older magnetorestrictive units, uh, which those are the ones that you use like Cavitron for your hygienist for cleanings. And those units have an elliptical motion. Uh, the elliptical motion compared to the linear, now the linear produce a lot less heat, a lot less heat means less water needs to be used, and whenever you have less water, you get a better vision, especially in endo, to see what we're doing. And often in endo, uh, clinicians, what they'll do, they won't use water coming out of the tip, uh, unless they're removing a post, for example. But we'll go in like 30 seconds burst at a time, and then go in with our air water and uh, just cool things, rinse things, and dry things out. Uh, now, the ultrasonic tips, how we use it, it always have to be used with light or almost no pressure. You want the tip to do the work. And remember, it's a linear motion, back to front. So it'll, the side of the tip is what's doing the cutting or the scaling, if you want to call it. The, the head of the tip, if you go ahead first, that's doing the knocking. Uh, so that will be used to remove a crown, a post, whatever you need some, to knock something out, but not to uh, uh, scale or open something you want to open uh, now the power on these units equals the amplitude which is you have to keep in mind that these tips are very expensive I mean some of them will run close to a hundred dollar uh, the thinner the tip the less amplitude it can handle so be careful what the manufacturer power instructions are on those tips if whenever you use them because some of them you can go you have to be patient and you go you can go too high in the power setting and you want to remember to use every minute at least uh, some air or water to cool things down. Again, it doesn't need as much as the older units, but it still produces a bit of heat. Now, ultrasonic and endo, why do we use them? Uh, we can use them to refine the access, uh, to get straight line access to the canal orifice, uh, like almost to replace the gate sclerons that we mentioned before, uh, to remove pulp stones, to open an isthmus, to trace a canal, and I'm just putting trace here in bold, uh, you want to be careful what tip you're using, because if you're using ultrasonics and to look for a canal, you want to have a, a rounded tip, which we'll talk about on the next slide. The rounded tip, the advantage won't create you a divot, which accidentally you think it's a canal and you end up perforating. So the pointy tips you'll be using whenever you know where the canal is, or like opening an isthmus, for example, like the third picture down here, 
and you just want to basically trace it down. Now, you can use it to activate the irrigants. Uh, to, you can reuse it to remove posts, to remove broken files, to prepare post spaces. And we use them also in microsurgery to do our retro preparations. Now, the ultrasonic tips, there's a bunch of them uh, out there uh, now. The thinner the grain of the diamond, uh, like the sign tip here on the right, some of them, even though they're thin, they're very cutting efficient. So you want to kind of try them uh, to see what you personally like. Uh, there's, although not much difference, it's mostly with the cutting efficiency of different instruments. So you just want to focus on the design. Start with the rounded tips. Uh, if you are using it to look for canals, and then you can move with pointy tips as you gain more experience to open isthmuses and uh, do some more in deep, uh, detailed work. Uh, there's some of them out there that are even bendable, the tips. Uh, obviously, when they're bendable, they won't be as cutting efficient. Uh, they won't last as long, but usually those are cheaper. And uh, usually you can use them for surgery as well as I have like for one tip multi, multiple use indications whenever you can bend them. Uh, other tips there is the endo success kit, which is a little kit that includes most like small ones, rounded ones, post removal ones. Uh, now the run tip that I was uh, talking about to help us locate the canals, uh, the ball end is to prevent the ditching and the perforations. It allows us to explore the pulp chamber with a smooth, clean and flat groove. It helps in the safe removal of calcification, pulp stone, secondary dentin, and many models out there. The tip is rounded and not pointy. Uh, now, whenever you want to remove a post, uh, what you there's two ways you can do that. You can either get a ball end tip or a conical tip, and those tips are very thick, so they are used to so you can put a high intensity, high power on your unit and they're designed to be placed head first. You look for a little undercut, you go head first and you start knocking it and you keep putting some water to cool things down and eventually the cement will break around the post and you can remove the post. Uh, some other designs are the slot uh, design tips and those tips basically wrap around the post uh, basically and you vibrate it back and forth. Uh, you can use ultrasonic even to remove, uh, sorry, to remove gutta perca to do your post preparations. So as they heat up, they melt the gutta perca and create their way down. Those tips will tend to be elliptical that will match whatever system post that you want. As for irrigants, activation, I won't go in detail again. That's not the point of this lecture. It's in another lecture of mine on cleaning and shaping. Uh, but uh, you can have tips and ultrasonics, the advantage what it can create is cavitation and acoustic streaming. Cavitation, it's thousands of little tiny bubbles that are produced uh, that implodes, it helps removing biofilms. And acoustic streaming is just the effect that it basically moves the liquid around to get it the, the sludging debris going into isthmuses, lateral canals, getting your arrogance really everywhere inside that canal uh, space. Okay, and now uh, other little things, of course, the endodontic explorer. Uh, there are many out there. Uh, the skinnier, now the skinnier they are, the uh, less they will last. They won't last a very long time. I still use the good old classic DG16, which is your regular endodontic explorer. It's thick, so it, you can put some force in it without it bending or you know going obsolete very quick. And what I use uh, for little uh, tricky spaces is uh, the endo handle. Uh, the endo handle, it's like a little pen. And uh, where you put on the top of that pen a file. You can either buy the files from the company that are already uh, designed at a 90 degree angle. Or what I do, and like in the top picture on the right, I just put any file and I just bend the tip of it. And the uses for those is whenever you're dealing with deep anatomy, especially in lower premolars, uh, whenever the canal is splitting mid-root or in the apical part of the root, uh, getting a regular file with your hands is almost impossible without blocking your view because it's going so deep. 
So this is the advantage is to basically get a very skinny, kind of like an explorer thing, all down to feel and see what's going on and open a canal up whenever you do find it. Uh, the M4 safety handpiece, uh, this handpiece uh, replicates the wind watching movement we do with our stainless steel files. And uh, I put it part of the access lecture just because sometimes you will find really classified canals and uh, many endodontists will use that to put a little uh, C file, a short C file inside that handpiece and that will go 30 degrees back and forth and that will help open the calcification quicker than going by hand. Well, you don't really need it if you're not doing many endos uh, every day, but if you are like any endodontist doing like, you know, five, six cases a day and they're mostly calcified, your fingers are going to start killing you with time. And that's where this handpiece comes in too handy. Uh, the triplex syringe or the Stropco irrigator, it's called also. A Stropco is the inventor. Uh, uh, what it is, it replaces your air water syringe and uh, it makes it a lot more efficient because it replaces the air water syringe with smaller delivery tips. And uh, you can either change your whole setup because you can use it for anything, from operative to endo to surgery, uh, or you can also buy little adapters that goes over your air water syringe and then you can put whatever tip you want. Uh, now the tip could be any tip you like. There's tons out there that you can use. It's a lure lock, so you can use any tip out there that you like or you have in your office. Now the uses for the triplex syringe, it's a very precise delivery of air. Whenever you want to blow air over a calcified area to see if you have that white accumulation of dentin uh, that replicates uh, that where the canal is. Uh, you can use it whenever you're doing a retreat, like the pictures on the right, to blow out all the junk after you're passing with your files. Uh, you can use it, some endodontists will use it for irrigation. I have a couple of, uh, uh, of them on my, uh, on my uh, cart, and one of them will be water, one of them will be uh, bleach, one of them will be ETA, one of them will be chlorhexidine, so I'll deliver it a lot more easily and efficiently. And you can also use the air, the precise air, to uh, thin out your bonding agent if you, whenever you have a small uh, prep, so you avoid having pooling of the bonding at the bottom of your prep. And we also use them in surgery to dry our retro prep before placing the MTA. So that was the first part. Hopefully you're liking this so far. And uh, the second part uh, will be the endodontic anatomy. So welcome to the second part, which is the endodontic anatomy. Uh, so we're going to go a bit over the basics and we'll go a bit more in details and other things, uh, just so we're all on the same uh, level. Uh, first, upper interiors. Uh, so upper interiors, and I'm just putting this here, uh, most of them, as you know, from lateral to central to canine, uh, most of them will have one canal, but I just want to put these things out there that some that sometime you can have exceptions, and those exceptions will tend to happen uh, more often with the lateral and the canine. Uh, some of it, uh, uh, study-wise, we've seen in the Turkish population, and it could be in some Asian population, that that could be more uh, prevalent. So just keep your eyes open whenever you look at an x-ray, and those are some cases here, a central incisor that I had with two canals on the top left, a lateral incisor with two canals that you see on the top right here. Uh, and the key is, like, if you look at this lateral uh, on top right, the pre-op, you can look, uh, looking at the pre-op, at the PDL, the lamina dura, if you're tracing it all around the root, you can see in the apical third that you almost have two roots at the end. You see two ligaments at the end. And that's an indication that it's not going to be an easy one. Uh, and you have to be prepared either to refer it or to book a lot of time in your schedule. And uh, the central incisor, that was a published case on the bottom, that actually had uh, three canals in it. It was pretty interesting. So just to keep in mind that uh, there are exceptions out there that you have to keep our eyes peeled to uh, catch them whenever they come to us. Upper premolars, uh, now, first premolars will have the most variations. Uh, they uh, will have uh, one, two, or even three canals. 
And the two canal configuration in some studies is pretty prevalent. So you should be having it pretty often. And whenever it has three canals, it's almost like a mini molar uh, in the way where you'll have a mesiobuccal, a distobuccal, two canals on the buccal, and one palatal. And you can see one of my colleagues, Dr. Wang, there in the top uh, third from the right, you can see one with three canals uh, at the end, and some that I did before that splits apically three of them. Uh, so just to keep in mind, and second premolars, they could have uh, one, two, or three, but it's more rare than the first. So the first, it uh, has a lot more variations to keep in mind whenever you're treating them. Uh, now, upper molars. Upper molars, that has been getting the most hype in the last couple of years uh, about MB2s, uh, because we started discovering as we use microscopes that MB2s are a lot more prevalent than we thought they were. Uh, back in the days, the way we used to teach things was almost like the top right image. We always used to say, whenever you're looking for an MB2, look at the line from the mesiobuccal to the palatal, and your MB2 should be on that line. Uh, now we're realizing that sometimes they are that way, but uh, many times they're like on the left, uh, top left uh, axis picture where MB2 will be hiding under the mesial wall, next palatal in direction from the MB, but it's under the mesial wall. It's not on a straight line from the MB to the palatal. It's deviated more mesially, as you can see on the top left picture. And as we're going to the second molars and third molars in the back, uh, everything gets all closer in together into a more line, a linear shape. Uh, and second molars will have less MB2s, uh, even though it's still up in the 60s, and third molars will even have less in, in case you happen to treat third molars. Uh, now, here's some studies that were interesting and some pictures. Uh, uh, the pictures on the left are top. It's a case that uh, recently had five canals in it, uh, another couple of cases that had different canals all over. And some studies here that are worth mentioning, one is from Khalid and Peters in the 90s. Uh, what they did basically, they started their axis. First, they took uh, hand instruments, meaning only your explorer and or files, and tried to look if they can find an MB2. And just by looking down like that, they found 54%. Now, by using a round burr and opening that mesial wall that we're going to be looking at later and what I showed you in the picture before, uh, it added another 31%, and adding a microscope added another 10%. So, even if you don't have a microscope, at least with your loops, you should be finding a lot of canals uh, higher than 85% almost of MB2s in your molars, at least. Another study by Stropko in uh, 99, uh, this one was done in B, uh, Boston University, BU. Uh, what they did, uh, what was interesting, they got first, uh, the first year residents, uh, they came in and they collected data how much MB2s they're finding. And the first year, basically without experience, they found 73% of first molars and 51% of second molars had MB2s. And toward graduation, their last year, uh, once they got more experience, they were finding 93% in molars, upper first molars, and 60% in second molars. So you need, ex the more you do, the better you're going to get, and you just have to know, hopefully from this lecture, what you're looking for, where you're looking for, uh, for it, and to eventually start finding them all over. Uh, lower interiors. Uh, now, Lower interiors, uh, there's a lot of variations out there. Uh, although most of them will have one canal, uh, an interesting study by Jim Benjamin and Dawson found out that the 41% of mandibular incisors had two canals, and oftentimes they end up joining. Uh, only 2% of this 41% was actually two separate canals. Most of them will join together. But if you're treating a tooth that's necrotic, a retreat that has an abscess, apical radiolucency, a leo, whatever you want to call it, and you don't find the second canal, well, it's not going to heal. You need to remove all the bugs in that root canal system. Uh, now, whenever you're looking, now we're looking at the picture on the bottom left. 
uh, whenever you are looking for the second canal, you start your access, like in the image on the left, and usually you find your canal, which is centered. So the second canal is usually always, not usually, it's always on the lingual, toward the cingulum of the tooth. So you want to take a round burr and push your axis more to the lingual, similar to the picture that you have on the right. And when, while you're doing it, what you're looking for is, do you still see white, chalky, clean dentin going down to where your initial canal that you found? Or is there some kind of funny anatomy opening up? Or is there like a gray floor that's showing up? Anything shiny, a catch? So you're looking for anything unusual. And you want to push it maybe two millimeters at least up back to the lingual, the round burr, to see where, uh, if there's a second canal. Now, lower premolars. Lower premolars, in my opinion, they are the toughest teeth to teeth to treat uh, due to the fact that they usually split uh, in the apical third or middle third and uh, the way they are located in the mouth is very hard to see down in those roots with an indirect or direct vision it's very hard to see so usually I joke and say if you have some of these cases you see them on the x-ray send them to uh, the endodontist uh, you hate in town <laughs> so uh, but yeah, usually if you see those, do consider please to send them to a specialist because they are very tough even for us to treat. Uh, now variations will be more often happening in the first premolar and then the second, similar to the upper teeth. Uh, second premolars, they mostly will have one canal. Uh, first premolar will have the variations and those will be tougher variations because usually they split deeper down in the root. Now, lower molars. Uh, lower molars, like it was the fashion, you might say, uh, for a while that we're talking about MV2s and upper molars. Uh, now it's becoming more the fashion to talk about middle mesial canals. Uh, like if you look at this uh, middle image here, you can see between the mesiobuccal and mesiolingual, you have some pink tissue going down in the middle. And that would basically be your middle mesial. Now, Looking at those uh, images here, uh, the middle mesial on the left picture, you see it's m and It's like the little candy, m and uh, You'll have the mesiobuccal, mesiolingual, and usually there's an isthmus joining both of them. If you do see that isthmus, you want to open the dentin over it to expose it. And once it's exposed, then you want to see if you get a catch. And if not, you might want to open it with ultrasonics. And the picture on the right represents whenever you don't have an isthmus, it's kind of, you know, a groovy floor. And sometimes you can have two distals in cases like those. And now the incidence of canal isthmuses, the chances of having an isthmus running from mesiobuccal to mesiolingual, uh, it's 54 to 89%, uh, depending on the studies you look at. Uh, now, Ba in 2004, uh, basically, he did a review of the literature and he was looking of a separate, basically, middle mesial canal and what's the prevalence of that. And it's rare. It's 1 to 15 percent to have a separate middle mesial canal. But usually they're even joining back with mesiobuccal, mesiolingual, or you have an isthmus. And again, if it's a case that's infected, bacteria will stay there. And if you don't take it out, it's going to cause a delayed failure. So you want to clean those areas, especially when it's infected. Uh, Wheeler in 95, he looked at the mesial roots of lower molars, he sectioned them, and uh, he basically was uh, showing that it's a narrow ribbon shaped communication between the two canals and it can contain tissue and it's present. Uh, Von Arx in 2005, he analyzed and classified those roots. Uh, the most prevalent is the type 4 to type 5. Uh, type 4 to type 5 basically is uh, the ribbon joining from mesiobuccal to mesiolingual. Some of the ribbon sometimes is wide open where you can really treat it as a separate canal in the middle and then go with ultrasonics and open it. And uh, it's the most prevalent is a type 4 and type 5. So basically whenever you have an isthmus, more so than a separate canal like the type 3. But it's out there. Now, the C-shaped canal, 
the C-shaped canal. Uh, you might see them in most uh, commonly in uh, Asian or Middle Eastern uh, population. Uh, basically, uh, it's whenever you go in the chamber, uh, you'll see the three canals all linked together by an isthmus, almost in the shape of a C, like you see on those pictures on the left. Uh, the C is most commonly seen facing the tongue, so usually it'll be your mesiolingual, and then you'll have the mesiobuccal that's often joined with the distal. And that's the first study by 2007 by uh, Jeff Razari. So it's usually a semicolon shape. So that's the semicolon. They mean the mesiolingual, sometimes a separate canal, and then the mesiobuccal and distal is joined all together in a ribbon, like a crescent. Uh, then uh, CEO on Park saw the prevalence about 30, higher than 30 percent in uh, the Korean population. And there's a nice study by Haddad and Nami in 99. It was done in Lebanon. Uh, and I like the study because basically it gives us clues whenever we're looking at the pre-op for the collision to know that we might be dealing with that. And those clues are whenever you look at a pre-op x-ray, if you see radicular fusion, you don't have separate mesial and distal roots. They're all fused together. You see one big, large distal canal and a very narrow, almost non-present mesial canal and a blurred image of something in between, almost like this actually that I have placed here. Uh, now, uh, that's about for the C-shaped canal. Now, that was a bit the review of the anatomy for us. Hopefully, it wasn't too boring for you. That's the basic part. Uh, now we're going to pass to the anatomy of the pulp chamber floor uh, what, and basically how to look for the canals once we're inside and where the chamber is. And then we'll pass to some fun clinical uh, pictures to uh, basically show you what we've been talking about. So, yeah. All right, so now that we pass the anatomy part, we're gonna go, uh, the general anatomy part, sorry. We're gonna go look specifically at uh, the anatomy of the pulp chamber floor. Uh, so uh, the paper is from Paul and Krasner and Renko that we talked about earlier. Uh, so basically, uh, the goal of this uh, paper, whenever they did it, was basically they said the average number of canals for a certain the type of tooth found in textbook is oftentimes no value when dealing with a specific case whenever like somebody's in your chair right there and oftentimes the location whenever you're treating a tooth for endo it's not a textbook case where you can go through the virgin crown to do your root canal they're often hotter because they're often malpositioned they're heavily restored you have tertiary dentin you have a crown it's calcified uh, so it gets more complicated than we see in textbooks so the question was, what should we look for to help us find our way when we're lost and we're looking for canals? And that's where they made their paper, uh, the anatomy of the pulp chamber floor. And what they did, they stick a bunch of teeth, uh, 500, and they uh, created some kind of rules, laws, if you want to say, uh, relationship first of the pulp chamber to the clinical crown. So that's the first step when you're starting your access. Where is our chamber? Or how to find it? So that's the first clues they give us. And then it's the relationship to the pulp. Once we're on the floor and we're looking for the canals, where are the canals? First part, the relationship of the pulp chamber, uh, chum, ch pulp chamber sorry, to the clinical crown. So where is that chamber? First law is the law of centrality and concentricity, meaning the floor of the pulp chamber is always located in the center of the tooth, and the walls of the pulp chamber floor is always concentric to the external surface of the tooth. So basically it's in the middle and everything should be of equal distance like we see here in this picture. Uh, what I like this picture before I go on the law of the CJ is that the thickness of dentin we see with those arrows should be about the same all around the tooth. Uh, so whenever if you found one canal let's say the mesiobuccal, you're looking for the mesiolingual, look at the dentist thickness from the outside to the uh, mesiobuccal. It should be about the same symmetrically from the other side, from the, me from the outside lingual to the mesiolingual. So if it's, if it's thinner, that means you're deviating and you're risking perforation. So stop and start looking 
you miss something closer in the middle. Now, the law of the CEJ, and that is almost our North Star, if you want to say, uh, the CEJ is the most consistent, repeatable landmark for locating the position of the pulp chamber. And that's easy to say, but keep in mind that the law of the CEJ, the CEJ goes uh, as much mesiodistally, uh, buccolingually, coronoapically. The chamber is in 3D at the level of the CEJ, so the cemento enamel junction. So whenever you're not finding yourself, you can remove the crown, uh, sorry, the rubber dam, if you have a crown, for example, and look at the CEJ. Where is it? Measure the depth of how much your access deep wise and the outside. Go with a probe and measure how much the CEJ all the way up to the coronal surface. And the chamber should be at the same depth from the CEJ to the coronal end, from the coronal end down to the chamber when you're going in. So once you get to that depth, you start going laterally opening it up and again you want something that's symmetrical going along with the CEJ you know replicating the shape in the CEJ is the shape of the chamber now once we find our chamber uh, where's the canals first law is the law of symmetry so except in maxillary molars which does it's not a symmetrical tooth all canals usually are equidistant if you draw a line from the middle of the distal of the, that tooth to the middle of the mesial of the tooth. Usually everything should be symmetrical from both sides. So meaning you found the distal, mesial buccal on one side, there should be the same amount of measurement millimeter wise going to the lingual to find your mesial lingual from the mesial buccal. law of color change which is we'll be looking more at clinical pictures later in color but the color of the pulp chamber floor is always darker than the walls and uh, the floor usually is gray it's a shiny gray and the shine goes away if you touch it with a burr but it stays gray but it won't be shiny and the walls are chalky white so you want to basically have chalky white with gray all around Uh, the orifice of the root canals are always located at the junction angle of the wall and the floor. So the orifice will always be between the chalky white and the gray floor at the junction between the two. And uh, that's kind of obvious too. The, law, the second orifice location law, it's usually at the end of the root developmental fusion line. So usually you follow the developmental fusion line and usually towards the end, you'll hit the chalky white wall, uh, wall, and that's where the canal will be. So some silly practice examples here. If you see something like that, how many canals could there be? Again, by symmetry, you know that you should have a fourth one. If you see something like this one, by symmetry, you know you're set. If you see something like that, let's say you, know, you found your two buckle, and you had a huge amalgam on the lingua that you just removed, you have tertiary dent in hiding it. Well, you know, looking at the CJ, you're, the symmetrically, there's something hidden under the calcification. So you should go with those secondary burrs that we're talking about before, expose those other two canals. And whenever you're dealing with something like that, like a big ribbon shape, well, that could be three or four. And I always recommend it, treating it as four. When you go with your files, go like F as if they were uh, four until you're proven otherwise with your filing and you can see something different. So in conclusion for this little portion, uh, the CJ should be considered as the ultimate North Star. The CJ is your best buddy to finding the pulp chamber. And again, remember, not only mesiodistally, buccolingually, but very useful is coronoapically. The CEJ is how deep you know where you should stop drilling before you go up perforating the floor. So keep the CEJ in your mind as your friend. Uh, the operator knows that he has completed the access when he can delineate the junction of the pulp chamber wall 360 degrees around the chamber floor. So basically you want chalky white with gray all around 360 degrees. Chalky white with gray. 
And after the junction is clearly seen, then use the law of symmetry, the law of color uh, to find your canals. So you're looking to have a 360 degrees all around, nice polished surface that makes it easy for your flies to glide in. Uh, and thus, you know, when your access is done. So now that we went through all the, the theoretical part, uh, will be the more uh, fun part for you guys, the clinical cases, which we'll be going through here next. All right, so now that we finish with the theoretical part, we're going to pass to a bit more fun uh, phase of this lecture, which is the clinical cases. So uh, that's a nice movie that I like, Ghost Towns, about Dennis, and this is how we do it. So we're in the clinical part here looking for middle mesials on the lower molars and we'll start with the upper molars how to look and find those mb2s so concerning upper molar cases we'll start with those cases in this part uh, so the famous mb2 and uh, that's a little uh, couple of pictures here and what we're looking at is uh, which is not often the case this is uh, where the mb1 is and it's on a line between the MB to the palatal. You see there's a little groove. Now the key in those cases is to open that groove. And again, I'm going to keep stressing over and over to push the mesial wall out. And as we push the mesial wall out with a small round burr, we uncover that groove and the MB2 is deep within that groove, which is more toward the mesial wall. And that's how once you find it, you open it and you instrument it. And uh, here again, a uh, couple of more cases, just before we start uh, a step by step, here's just some pictures where the MB2 is, what we, where we're looking for it. And uh, again, the key is to expose the floor map beneath the mesial wall with a round burr. Uh, and uh, you, like we said before, like a round burr number one, usually does the trick or two, whatever you're more comfortable with, just to expose that mesial wall more, have a more direct uh, access to it and a direct view to it. And that's where the MB2 is, is hiding under that wall. So we need to expose it to see it. And uh, that's even a better example. You can look on the picture where you have the red arrow on the left, uh, where the MB1 is. And you can see it's completely covered, the MB2, under like almost like tertiary dentin, if you want to call it. But it's really under that mesial wall. So as we took the round burr and pushed that mesial wall out, then you expose that area where then we are able to put a file in to negotiate it and open it without any uh, stress on the file. Uh, so here's the first case. It's an upper first molar, uh, irreversible pulpitis with, uh, it was a symptomatic apical periodontitis. Uh, that's on the left, our axis, once we started. And toward the right, we go in and we zoom into the mesial buccal area. So as we're zooming in, you see there's the MB canal, the MB1, and then there's an isthmus. Now, whenever we see an isthmus like that, the question is, is there a separate MB2 canal or is it an isthmus that we can open with ultrasonics, for example? And the way to do that, uh, we start first with round burrs. And what we're uh, looking here is after I pass a little round burr over that line that we saw, as I passed it, what happened is, uh, we see accumulation of dentinal debris. And that's the nice thing about round burrs. As we pass them, they create a smooth finish of the floor and we can see wherever there's an area that had uh, uh, dentin shavings, which accumulates and create like, you know, little white spots where this red arrow is. So whenever we see this accumulation of debris, that's where a canal is likely to be. And we should go toward the end of that white line toward the end of the terminus, and that's where we start poking to see if we can get a catch with our files. Uh, so as we found that canal toward the end of that line, we went with little C files and the rotaries, and that's what we see here, the progression toward how we open the canal. And that's the final x-ray. Now you can see that was an amazing hook on this tooth. It was almost a 90 degree. And I have another lecture that will be coming up soon. It's uh, concerning instrumentation. And in this lecture, we'll be talking about an obturation, another lecture, about how to get those crazy curves. If you're interested, you can consider looking at those other lectures. But this lecture, we're focusing on access and how to find the canals per se and not how to instrument them. That will come in the other lectures. 
Uh, now, that's another case. We were looking at the first molar, and that was the case that was uh, problematic here. It was prev previously treated with uh, an acute apical abscess, and palpation was around that mesiobuccal root, where we see the gutta is perfing, there's a strip perforation in that root. Uh, so we started the retreat, and that's the initial access. We can see the gutta remains. And already here, you can imagine the lower right, that's the mesiobuccal. And in the mesiobuccal, you can already see that the mesiobuccal, that wall was not exposed. And now we go in for more pictures. Uh, now it's uh, the pictures are rotated, so that's uh, the mesiobuccal is on the upper left. And you can see with the red arrow is that wall that wasn't exposed. You need to take a round burr. You can see there's an undercut almost where the arrow is. We need to take a round burr to uncover that undercut. We don't want any undercut in our access. Anything, everything has to be exposed. Everything has to be smooth from the gray floors, junctioning, going into a smooth transition with, a, with the chalky white walls. So we want chalky white walls with gray floors all the way around. And that's as we pass the round burr, that's what we get on the right. And then we started seeing a black line, uh, the isthmus in a way. And then again, you can go directly right there with files, see if you can get any catch. And usually it's going to be toward the end of that isthmus line. Uh, so at the lower part of the black line we're seeing here. And if you don't get a catch, you go with round burrs like we're saying to see if we get a more definite point. Now, uh, in this case, we kept the gutta initially where it's stripped just so we don't push the bleach out and it's kind of a matrix that uh, we used uh, to guide our files back in the original canal. Uh, now, the MB2 here was located. Uh, you can see the file on the left picture getting our stick and then negotiating it with C files, opening it down, rotaries, and that's what we get on the right picture. Now, this case, after we finished the instrumentation, then I went with my microscope to remove the gutta perca that was there, and I did an MTA repair uh, prior to the final obturation. So I removed the gutta perca that was stripped, and I filled that stripped area with MTA. Uh, it's tricky, but thankfully with the microscope, we can do that kind of things. And uh, that's a two-year follow-up. So we see the MTA is healing well. We have the lamina dura healing around it. Uh, and the abscess uh, left, and everything's good in this case now. Uh, now, that's uh, another case. It was a second upper molar. And looking at it on the pre-op, we can already suspect that we don't see any canal uh, specific roots. They all seem like they're fused. The anatomy looks suspicious, and it, that it's not going to be a straightforward case. And as we look at the clinical pictures, you can see that it was it's nothing... Uh, like any tooth we see in any textbook. Uh, it's a very unique anatomy in this tooth. And the only way to really know how to follow our axis here is follow, like we mentioned before, the North Star of Endo, which is the CEJ, the cinnamon to enamel junction all around the tooth. That's what we follow to know where to start our axis and where to open our axis. Now, once we're into the axis, then we follow the color of the floor. And what we're looking for, which is like you see in the picture on the right, exposing all the gray floor until we get a junction with the chalky white walls, until we see it all around 360 degrees, and that's where we know our axis is complete. Uh, once our axis is complete, uh, then we found here three canals, and I saw the a possible fourth canal you can see on the lower, middle lower part of that picture, that there's a little point that wasn't clear what it was and I couldn't get a patency yet. So we had to dig deeper. So we went with round burr deeper and deeper until we found that where the canal we thought it was is were actually junctioning almost a 90 degree toward the palatal. So that was a palatal, second palatal canal and joining all the way sideways going with the palatal. And those cases like this tooth with a weird anatomy before starting, like unique anatomy, should we say, uh, the only way to follow it is the rules that we mentioned before, the colors, the isthmuses, the color change of the walls, and eventually you find all those canals. And that was the final lecture here. Uh, upper first molar, again, it's a retreat here. Uh, it had an abscess in this case. So 
And also, if we look at that X-ray before, you, there's a big composite and could be leaking as well over the years. And that's what might have caused the failure. Uh, now, as soon as we created our access here, we found the gutta perca. And if we look at the mesiobuccal area, you can see the mesiobuccal and they have some kind of isthmus that they opened. Now, we started removing with a round burr, like we said before. And now as we zoom in the mesiobuccal area, around the mesiobuccal wall, we can see the mesiobuccal gutta perca that they found. And then there's an isthmus and obviously they didn't open the whole thing. You can see there's the orange gutta perca line followed by a black line that was never opened and finishing with almost like a bulbous circle. And we need to open that. So first step is taking the round burr because they give us a nice finish uh, to know where we're at and to see if it's separate MB2. And what we're looking for is, will there always be a continuous line or is there a separate accumulation of debris into that line somewhere which could be the separate canal, the MB2. So as we passed our smaller and smaller burrs here, the progression from the top left to the bottom right, you can see that it went from a potential little point that we couldn't get a stick with a file. We kept opening until it became like a nice little continuous line. And at that point, when we see a nice continuous line of that sort, then you can take small ultrasonic dips and open, finish opening, cleaning that area with ultrasonics because there is no separate MV2. And that's the progression here with our ultrasonic dips, slowly opening until we get a nice clean uh, canal. And here's the before and after. You can see there's a that drastic difference on how a canal should open. That mesiobuccal root is never a circular root. It's an ovoid root. So you cannot have just one circular canal. Either there's two canals or there's one ovoid canal, which we can see in the shape here. And that's the final radiograph. A bit over-instrumented, but I mean, it's a re it was a retreat, so it's not too bad. Uh, that's an upper for smaller. It's from uh, Clark and Kademi. They have a beautiful article that they published in 2010 that has some nice pictures and I put them here to share them with you. Uh, so that's the clinical picture and the x-ray before starting. So first step is uh, you start your axis following the outline. They removed here the amalgam. That's why it's a bit bigger. And then as they found where the canal is, uh, the chamber, sorry, is uh, the second part after they went in is exposing that mesial wall where I have that red arrow. And as they went with their round burr opening that mesial wall, that where MB2 was exposed under that area, which they found. And that's after they filled it with the perca and they placed their composite here. Uh, another case here from the same group, from Clark and Kademi, again, uh, it's another molar to a PFM crown this time. So, like we said, mentioned before in the instruments, first you go with a, a diamond burr to remove the porcelain. Once you're through the porcelain, you take a nice fresh carbide burr to cut through the metal. Once you're inside, then you can take uh, whatever burr you want. I take a diamond burr to create my outline. And the outline is following the CEJ here. And you can see their outline is really following the contour of the tooth, which is following the CEJ. And once you have the outline created, then you take the whole outline deeper and deeper, a couple of millimeters at a time, until you get a pulp horn exposure, like you have on the right picture. Once you have the pulp horn exposure, you take some round burr and you start de-roofing that chamber until like we said before, we exposed the whole gray floor junctioning with uh, the chalky white walls all around. So here they started de-roofing it on the left. And as we're going to the right here, they take the endo bird, the tapered bird we mentioned before. And uh, they're basically opening, widening their access internally to make sure that they have the chalky white walls junctioning with the gray floor at the bottom. And you can see here as they went with that endo zebra, you can see how everything is finishing flush between those walls and the gray floor. Everything, the whole 360 degrees, it's all nicely done. And then they know the canals are inside, which they found here and instrumented. That's their garaperka and their final lecture with the foundation. 
So now we finish the upper molars and the second part will be lower molar cases that we'll be looking at here. So in the next uh, audio file. So let's continue here with the lower molar cases, the clinical cases. So in lower molars, what the key is here we're focusing at is the mesial root and how to analyze that isthmus and how to see if we have a middle mesial canal. So after we find in every case the mesial buccal and mesial lingual, then we need to expose the floor map beneath the mesial wall. Again, that's the area, the mesial wall, we need to expose it. Initially, we start with round burrs and then with ultrasonics as it gets deeper and more delicate. And uh, what we're looking for to see in the middle area, if we can get a catch, a separate dental accumulation that can lead us to a little catch with a file, that could be the middle mesial canal. If not, many times the nismus that we need to open with ultrasonics. So again, what I'm stressing here is basically how to open that mesial wall. Often like the left, there'll be like, you know, a chuck of a triangle of dentin hiding that anatomy. We need to open it and slowly we'll get to that right picture, which will should even push more than that to have that mesial wall at the level of the orifice openings and then it will be an easier access to analyze that isthmus and the canal. Uh, that's another case from Castellucci, it was a retreat and he found there was a missed canal. In the middle, again, see how he exposed the mesial wall so he can get a nice straight view to it and that's where he got a catch with his file and ended up opening it and having the three canals. So some clinical cases, lower second molar, it was a necrotic case. And here the interesting part was to note that pulp stone, even before starting, we know we're getting into trouble. And best way to remove pulp stone is ultrasonics because it breaks it with the vibration. And we, the ultrasonic is not gonna make crumble any real dent construction within a tooth. But whenever you put it over the stone, the stone is a weak structurally and it's gonna start crumbling in pieces which is a nice way to remove the chuck of block of pulp stone denim without affecting the real tooth structure. So this tooth had five canals, on a two, three in the mesials, two in the distals that we see here in the pictures. And that's uh, with the Garaperca. And I like putting purple composite on cases that are kind of broken down, just so in case the temporal releaks or the patient takes a while to see his dentist, it's gonna be nice and covered and sealed. Uh, so we'll avoid bacterial contamination from the saliva. Uh, that's the final radiograph of that case. Uh, so lower second molar here, and uh, we notice the amalgam with some recurrent decay. And always, whenever you have a big amalgam, if you can, always try removing the whole restoration uh, because many times there's some recurrent decay under and or sometimes you see some fractures so you can assess the restorability of these teeth. Uh, now the key in this case, I just wanted to note like how in this case there wasn't a separate uh, middle mesial canal, but still whenever I find the mesial buccal mesial lingual, we want to open that isthmus area to expose it and you can see in the right pictures a nice clean white dentin and then you know there's nothing else, you just have the two main canals but you need to expose that area to make sure you're not leaving any middle mesial canal or an unclean isthmus in the middle. And that was the case completed, two distal, two mesials. Uh, that's a retreat, and uh, I put this case because it's uh, something to stress here, is whenever you see retreat cases that you're interested in doing, and like in the distal root here, uh, whenever you see a garaperca in the apical third and then it disappears with some kind of cement lining like on the distal root that we're seeing here, uh, chances are this is a fiber post. And the fact that it's a fiber post thing should ring an alarm bell because they're very hard to remove uh, when they're properly done. Uh, some dentists, sometimes you go in and you'll find the post was poorly cemented and they're, then we're lucky, it's easier to remove. But most of the time, it's well-selected post and they're well-cemented inside. Uh, the difference is whenever it's a metal post, the metal post, you put the ultrasonic, the ultrasonic energy goes through the post and it breaks the cement, the seal with the cement, and then you can take the post out once it breaks the seal and it's easy to take out. 
Uh, but when it's a fiber post, the energy of the ultrasonic doesn't go through it, and it actually starts melting sometimes, the fiber post. So it really doesn't lead you anywhere. So most of the time, those posts, posts have to be drilled out, which is dangerous whenever they're that deep if you don't have a microscope to guide you where you're going. Uh, so as we did our access, we got the two mesial canals. The One of the mesial buckle was poorly instrumented, as you can see. And the distolingual here was missed uh, canal. And then you ha we had the fiber post. Now, in this case, I used the Unicore drill. I think it's from Ultradent. And you can also use very small round burrs. Uh, they all do the job. The Unicore drill has a very sharp point that sticks in the middle of the fiber post. And as you start spinning it, it heats. So it starts melting the fiber post. And the blade starts cutting all around. And the idea is that little pin at the tip, the sharp pin, will keep you centered with the fiber post. And you'll go deeper and deeper. Now, the key is every couple of millimeters, make sure you stop, you clean, you dry. And that's an indication here for the strop corrugator, the triplex syringe, the small air uh, blast that we talked about and the instrument section, because you can really go dry that canal quickly with air, see where you're at, see if you're still centered within dentin, and see if you have, like the last picture here on the right, the gutta perca exposed. You can see the pinpoint in the apical part, there's gutta perca. Once it's exposed, you can get a catch with your file and then you're in business. You can open it up. Uh, but usually I go about two, three millimeters at a time, stop, check, make sure I'm still centered within the color, within the root, uh, within the fiber post, and keep on going deeper and deeper until I hit the gutta perca. Uh, so here we open the isthmus in the mesial. Uh, again, the mesial wall, we pushed it out to expose it. And we had four canals in this too, two mesials, two distals. All right. Uh, now, uh, another case. Again, it uh, was a new bridge. Uh, They're planning a new bridge and uh, because of recurrent decay. And they wanted a pre-prothetic endo for potential post space to get some anchorage for the new bridge. So I made my access to the PFM crown. We found the mesial canals, they're nice and vital, but I couldn't find the distal at that point. So I took some other x-rays, angled x-rays. I can, we can see the lumen of the canal. So the canal should be there. So we kept digging, following the colors, like we talked about the gray colors with the white floors, make sure we're centered with the CJ and all this kind of stuff. We kept going a bit deeper and deeper to the point where I ended up exposing it was a fiber post, a fiber post that had very well chosen colored composite. And that's what we had a hard time exposing it. But you have to realize that fiber post was placed inside a viral case without doing the root canal. Whoever did the root canal before the uh, bridge work before placing a post, it was done somewhere in the Middle East, I think, uh, didn't plan a root canal and it's amazing that the patient was asymptomatic. I guess there's no bacteria that got inside. But cases like this are cases where we might get misled if we're not paying attention to reading the floor of the tooth and where we're going, and we could easily end up perforating if we're not careful. So this case, we ended up having the fiber post. Once we seen it, we ended up drilling it out. As we went deeper and deeper, you can see here, we put a bit of bleach and from the champagne kind of bubble effect coming from the canals, we can see there's actually two distal canals. We can see two bubbly fuzzies coming out of that root. So there's two distals in that one. And you can see them in the final radiograph in the left, two distals and two mesials. And we had a post space left for the dentist. Uh, which brings us here to another lower first molar. And what's interesting about this case, and I'd like to share with you is, it was a first molar that was necrotic and it has an apical abscess and there is no restoration, no decay, nothing. It's a virgin looking tooth. And whenever you see cases like that, it should ring a bell automatically that the only way that bacteria got in there to cause pulpal necrosis is a fracture. And there's love in 96 showed that even whenever we have little craze lines that we see in the teeth, sometimes those are enough to have bacteria leak inside and cause damage to the pulp tissue, causing pulpal necrosis. 
So whenever you're doing a case like that, always advise the patient that they're likely going to be a fracture and the prognosis will be guarded, all depending on how deep that fracture is going. So as we started here at Axis, we were hunting down a fracture, which was, like we suspected, was inside. So the fracture was on the distal wall, running down, but stopping at the level of the orifice. You can see the red arrow in the second picture. Uh, we follow, we trace that line. It's going just at the level of the orifice, but it's not dipping below the CEJ. And that's the key when you're assessing the prognosis in teeth with fractures. If the fracture line goes into the root below the CEJ level, there's no way of isolating it for one. And for two, whenever the patient bites, if this thing going where the ligament is, the PDL, the periodontal ligament is around that root, every time they're going to bite, it's, they're going to feel a little pinch inside and that pinch will never go away. So you have to warn the patients. And if it's going that deep, likely it's gonna end up leaking. Again, bacteria will infiltrate again, even after you clean the root canal and thing can fail. But this case, we're lucky just because the fractures weren't dipping deep inside. So as long as we place the crown after with a good sealing buildup, things should be under control. But whenever I do cases that have fractures like that, just to be safe so there's no uh, surprises that can cause frustration either from the patient or from us, the clinicians, what I do is usually I put calcium hydroxide inside these teeth and leave it for a week. After the patient, at least a week, or you can leave it longer. But when the patient comes back uh, later, after one to two weeks, uh, you can do the percussion test, your biting test, make sure he's asymptomatic. And if everything is look good, then there's hope for that tooth. And we can finish it, put a crown, and things should be okay. Uh, now, if patients are still symptomatic, then that's where usually I tell the patient, giving the fracture, it's not looking good. Uh, we might want to consider taking out that tooth and stop investing more and more in it. And maybe an implant would be or a bridge would be a better choice. But uh, the calcium hydroxide trick is a good way to clean the canals, put the calcium hydroxide, check again in two weeks and see how things uh, follow up. And if everything is good, they're symptomatic, then fill it and you're good to go. Another case here, it was a pulpitis case, uh, second molar, the root are kind of fused. And uh, once we got inside, uh, it was a C-shaped anatomy. And again, the C is, the belly of the C is facing the tongue. Uh, so the buckle would be outside of the C, meaning on the upper part, and the tongue will be on the lower part in this case. And this case was, like we said, like almost like a comma shape. We had the mesolingual, which is the point, and then the semi-lunar shape was the distal with a fin going toward what would be the mesial buckle. And that's where, in these cases, ultrasonics are critical to open things and clean things up. And that's the final radiograph. You can see the mesolingual canal and then the distal with that fin going toward the mesial buckle. Uh, here, our lower second molar, uh, it was an irreversible pulpitis. Uh, again, we are, there was three mesial canals on this one, and I just want to show you how much we had to push the mesial wall out. So the area that we expose has to be the same level as the other orifices. So the mesial isthmus is at the same level as the mesial lingual and mesial buccal. All that area has to be opened at that level, mesially. And that's the Garapurka that's inside. And then I put that purple resin. You might be seeing it more and more if you, uh, from your colleagues and the donors sending you back cases. Uh, we're using it just to seal and diminish uh, saliva, saliva leakage, bacterial leakage into our canal system after we disinfect it. Uh, you can leave that there. The intention is to leave that composite there and you put your buildup over it and you don't have to worry about it. But the reason why we choose it purple in case you decide to put a post in like the distal root, it's easy for you to see and drill out and uh, expose it to see it and make your post space if you need a post space. And that's why we put the purple color, but you can leave it there. And that's the final radiograph. Uh, and another case from the Clark and Academy group, it was the first molar with a gold crown. Uh, so they started the access, and the key here is, again, we followed the CEJ, 
uh, doing our outline, you bring it deeper and deeper until you, uh, you found some kind of pulp horn. And in this case, there was no pulp horn because it was all a calcified chamber with a pulp stone in the middle. And that's what you see. And the way to know it's a pulp stone, we're following the chalky white walls all around until we hit the floor. But it's not gray yet. It's not a nice, cr crisp, gray, shiny floor. It's kind of this yellowish color. And then all around the junction between a chalky white walls with that funny colored dentin, you see the accumulation of white debris. And that's kind of, you know, where the pulp stone is. So the key is if you have an ultrasonic, you take the ultrasonic around that white outline, which we do in the next pictures, and we kind of follow it all around until pieces of it start chipping off and breaking. And slowly we kept going deeper and deeper following that outline until the whole pulp stone in the middle is kind of loose and then you flick it off with uh, your spoon excavator or your explorer. So here the piece is removed. Then they took, uh, you can see your outline, the gray floor is starting to show. And now we're, not, we're at the floor. And at this point, you follow the symmetry of the tooth for lower molars, the colors, the terminuses, uh, all these uh, rules that we talked before, and we find our canals. And again, you can see on the mesial how they're pushing that mesial wall out from the left picture to the right picture to expose that mesial isthmus to explore it. And in this case, uh, you can see on the left how after the all it's nice and clean, you got two distal, two mesials with a nice exposed isthmus in the middle to make sure that you can get a catch. And in these cases, you can take really a small ultrasonic if you want, ideally, to open it a bit more. And that's the Garaperka picture with the final x-ray. Uh, to finish here, we have uh, one premolar case and one anterior case that are interesting to share with you. Uh, this is an upper second premolar that I did. And before starting, what's interesting, I took an angled shot here just to see if there's anything different. But you can see that you see the chamber and then everything disappears. There's almost no canal lumen that we see if you compare to the canine on the left. The pr two premolars is almost disappears. We can't see what's going on. So before starting, expect to be funny anatomy. And even if you trace the PDLs, uh, the lamina dura, you can see there is almost two on the buckles and one big palatal. It's hard to see, but as you play with your brightness, if you have a nice software, you can detect them, detect them more. So that's our axis. We found our palatal. We found two buckles. But as we started to look at the symmetry, and if you look at the lower canals on the right picture, it, it still had kind of an undercut, if you notice. It's not as smooth as the upper one. So we went with a round, small round burr and uncovered it just to see if anything is under that little undercut. And as we opened on the upper left, you see there was an extension of the dark gray floor. So we kept opening and there was three buckle canals. And those, uh, I put my files to take my working length. And that's the final radiograph. A premolar with four canals. Very rare, but it's, it's out there. And that's my one year follow up. And uh, we did another root canal on this lady. Uh, another case that's interesting, an upper central. Uh, it had a trauma a long time ago. Over the years, that's calcified. And uh, it ended up needing a root canal. Uh, so these calcified cases, and it's a nice little trick that I'm putting you here, you start your axis following the ideal axis you know in your textbook and following the CEJ, you bring it down to the level of the CEJ. Once you're at that level of the CEJ, take around burr, polish the floor area that you exposed, and that's what you should look at on the top left. And if it, the canal is not that crisp for you to see, I mean, this image is of a microscope, so you see the light and it's clear to see that you have a little point in the middle. But usually it's not that clear with the naked eyes or you're just losing 2.5 or 3.5 loops. So one trick to keep in your bags is just get methylene blue. You can buy it at any pharmacy. It's very cheap. You just put it on a cotton, 
it's good to trace fractures whenever you see fractures. It's good to trace canals whenever you see canals. We use it when we do apical surgery as well. So it's methylene blue is a good thing to have around. So you just smear it all around your axis, the little uh, cotton, the cotton ball, and then you rinse your whole axis. And this stuff will trace organic material, which that tissue, bacteria, and that's what traces the canal. You can see a little blue point in the middle. And then you know that's where your canal is. You can take little C files, and that's how we opened it here. So, and as I mentioned before, if possible, always try to remove the old restoration prior to your access. And the reason for that, that's Abbott, he's in Australia. Uh, what he noticed is, uh, just as he did his access initially, looking through the access on all around the tooth he found in 245 teeth that he evaluated that only 19 percent had caries 20 percent had cracks and some had marginal breakdown uh, now as he removed all those restoration completely he noticed that under those restorations he had a lot of recurrent decay from 19 percent thinking he had any decay 86 percent almost 90 percent of these teeth had recurrent decay under him that we need to clean up. So always try if you can, especially if you're the restoring dentist, to remove all that restoration prior to your access to see what you have dealing with, how bad are the cracks or fractures, how bad is the decay, is the tooth restorable, uh, tell the patient if he needs a crown lengthening, uh, see if the tooth can be saved even, or you can discuss treatment options with the patient. So just so you don't have any bad surprises at the end when you come to restore, so the patient is not frustrated, that you're not frustrated. So it just avoids a lot of awkward situations if you know what you're dealing with and the restorability of the tooth before starting the root canal. So that's about it. Just reviewing here uh, our course learning objectives. Uh, so we wanted to list the tools initially. Uh, we talked about the ultrasonic, the burrs, the lights, the loops. Uh, describe the, the anatomy of the numbers of canals and what to expect, the landmarks, uh, understanding how to look at the clinical crown, the CEJ, to find where the, our chamber is, understand once we have a, once we're in the chamber, what we are looking for, the relationship on the pulp chamber floor, the colors, the terminuses, uh, the groove lines, uh, know when to keep looking, when to stop, uh, the color, the gray floor, following our colors, that's the biggest key to know where to stop, and the symmetry in teeth. Uh, know how to look for MB2s, how we're gonna push always that mesial wall out a couple of millimeters, and the same thing for the middle mesial canal and lower molars. Push that mesial wall to have a good view, to have a good access, to know what you're dealing with. And a uh, nice saying by Vince Lombardi, which I like, practice doesn't make perfect, Perfect practice makes perfect. So keep pushing yourself to find all these canals and the more you do, the better you're gonna get, the more rewarding it's gonna get and the more happy you're gonna be with your work and the better outcomes you're gonna have with your work. So thank you for taking this course. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, avoid the drama and enjoy your endo, meaning stay in your comfort zone Consent and document everything. If you're, it's cases that as soon as you start your access, you're not comfortable. In order to avoid stress, and you know, us dentists, our stress rate is pretty high. Uh, specialists are out there, colleagues, endodontists are out there. Uh, extend your hand for help when you need it. I'm sure they're gonna help you out. They'll be more than happy to help you out. And as you gain confidence, I'm sure you're going to be more and more comfortable doing more complex cases and you're going to enjoy and do a lot more. So uh, keep the good work and hope you enjoyed this lecture and hope uh, you'll follow some of my other lectures that will be posted there soon. Thank you very much and uh, have a good day. Bye bye.